BioBalance HealthCast episode 190, Low Testosterone and Blood Disorders. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. This week, Dr. Maupin and I are going to be talking about uh, hemoglobin counts, hemoglobin counts, red blood cell counts, uh, and some of the things that can go wrong and, and why it's of concern when you're looking at the question of hormone replacement therapy. Because a lot of the symptomology that manifests with some blood cell disorders match almost exactly the symptomology that manifests with testosterone loss. So a physician has to know the difference and know what they're looking at. And the reason that this came up is because uh, my wife was actually visiting Kathy's office the other day, and she came home and she told me about it. And then I asked Kathy, and she she will tell the story. But a patient came in all excited and pumped up, a, a male patient, who, who caught Kathy walking down the hallway in front of everybody and says, you saved my life. You saved my life, and I want to tell everybody, you saved my life. And Kathy was like, do I know you? <laughs> no, I didn't say <laughs> you that. You didn't know. Yeah. I just said... I said, does that mean I saved your marriage? Does that mean I saved, yeah. that's what I said. Do what I, part of your what life? What part of your life did? And he says, literally, my life. So so tell what this is about. Okay, so this this gentleman saw me um, in my, our Kansas City office, uh-huh. but he actually came to St. Louis for um, a, his dose of testosterone. And when he first was a patient, he had both low testosterone on his lab sheet, right. and he had a very high red blood cell count and a low platelet count. So... This gave me. This made me say, I need to meet with this man, but I'm not positive I'm going to give him pellets until after I talk to him and look at him. But in any case, he came to my office. He had all the symptoms of both high red count, which was being tired, and and he he was nauseated, and he was he couldn't get out of bed, no motivation. He felt like everything was he was heavy. Uh, and he just couldn't do anything. Mm-hmm. So that's one of those. Those are also symptoms of low testosterone. So for me, I had to figure this out because not only is a high red count something that should be treated on its own, but testosterone makes the high red count worse. So if you don't have a doctor who knows what they're doing with testosterone and they blow past your red count or they don't even do a red count, mo- many of the of the franchise type. Uh, practices that do pellet therapy for both men and women, they don't even check a blood count. They don't check half the tests or more than half the tests that I check. But it's very important because if you have this illness and you're given testosterone, testosterone can make it worse. It makes your red count go up. So I look at both this issue of too many red cells, but I also look at too much iron. So we're going to talk about the two problems that both mimic testosterone loss, right. and tes- and we're going to talk about the dangers of having too high a white count or too much iron in your system. And this is primarily something that happens after menopause for women and usually in the 50s, late 40s or 50s and above for men. But this gentleman came in and said, you caught my Jack, J-A-K-2 mutation by making me go to my internal medicine doctor who then really didn't want to treat me or even investigate it. So you sent me to a hemoc doctor, which is a hematologist oncologist. And that doctor found my JAK2 mutation, which means I have too many red cells. Sometimes too many platelets are not enough. And I need to have my blood. He, he needed to have his blood removed from his body. He already had six draws and dumps, they throw the blood away, so that he could get rid of some of those red cells because the danger is stroke and heart attack. And his doctor said it was an amazing, it was a miracle that he was still alive because most men had already had a stroke or a heart attack that what, that killed them by the time that this they were 50. So he literally did have his, his life saved because of our protocols and the fact that we look at everything before we start treating. So is the simple solution just to draw blood out and throw it away? I mean, it's like his his red blood cell factory is on high speed 24 hours a day. You got it exactly. It's It doesn't have an off switch. Jack's 2, basically, if you want to just take it down to 
basic a basic picture of your red cells. It's uh, your red cells are made in your bone marrow with your white cells and your platelets, and the bone marrow doesn't turn off red cell production. So you just keep making it. In normal people, there's rest where you don't have to make more because you've got enough and they last 90 days. So the the bone marrow makes them and then slows down and then speeds up. So it's like an automated factory that's programmed. Every day we produce this many red, this many white, this many platelets. And that's the way most of us work. Right. And there's a gene that's a switch that sets that program in operation. And he had a mutation. And he had a gene. mutation in that gene that didn't have an off switch. Right. So now, this isn't common. It's not a common illness. Uh -huh. But it is something that has to be worked up at, by a specialist, I would say. But some internal medicine doctors are, are very capable of doing this. So, so if... It's a genetic mutation. It's not something that's a lifestyle trigger or an accident trigger. I mean, he had this from birth. His whole life. Okay. And his sons need to be checked for it. And, and daughters, you can also have it in women as well. But since women have periods their whole life, oftentimes they, they don't of see blood. any of this right. until they're in menopause where they're not bleeding anymore. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes then we start seeing it. And I check for this, uh, obviously, in women as well. But testosterone makes the problem worse but he and his doctor came to a conclusion that if he just kept giving blood that the testosterone wasn't going to harm him and he felt so much better on testosterone after we gave it to him that i agreed to continue to give it to him right. uh, as long as he kept donating his blood but his doctor said he was normal as long as he kept his counts down and uh as long as he saw his hemoc doctor and his and his hemoc doctor was very unhappy that the internal medicine doctor didn't see this for years. He's had these counts. It was the first time I'd ever see, seen them. But it wasn't worked up. I mean, nobody had ever done any more testing. So that's that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. we do those tests is to find people who are have too many red cells, too much blood, red blood cells. And we look for anemia because the low blood counts are also a reason to be tired. So I don't want to treat somebody with testosterone if they're fatigued, if that's all they have, they just are fatigued and it's from not enough iron. So, so that's what you do when you talk about normals for blood counts. You run tests on blood. They take six, seven vials of blood and mm -hmm. you run all these different tests. Twelve tests. Looking for normal ranges of a lot of different things. And if mm -hmm. any of those are skewed the, to up or down to mm -hmm. catch your attention, then you have to address why is this skewed before you make the decision about replacing testosterone. Right. And so and, it's not something you just go, oh, oh, here, here's some testosterone. See ya. It's yeah. really something you should be looked at first. Even though JAX2 is is very un, not common, right. it is very rare, The uh, there is another issue with this where you see a high red count or a high ferritin level. Ferritin is the amount of, it measures or is a mirror of the amount of iron you have in your body. Now, generally... Hence, Ferritin. Ferritin. F-E-R. Yeah. yeah. So this is, <laughs> yes. And well, it's, it, it's it actually word. can happen in men and women. And at first, I just tested men because it's much more common in men. Right. But, but again, I, Because of the period thing? Yeah. Okay. Right. And so, and so you don't really look for it in women until menopause. And I don't know many internists that actually run ferritin on their yearly visits. But because mm -hmm. testosterone increases iron absorption, increases red cells, I found, I, I mean, I wasn't trained to do this. This is something that I actually believe should be done because it does do that. You have to know what testosterone does to know what to test for and what it could make worse. So I kind of, I added this to my panel a long time ago. Now, I, I remember as a child back in the dark ages of television when everything was black and white <laughs> that there was a company named Phillips Milk of Magnesia and they ran all these commercials for people that had iron poor blood. Why is that relevant? What What do we need iron in our blood for? Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't Milk of Magnesia, it was something else. But that's okay, Milk of Magnesia is magnesium. And that, that's for constipation. Maybe I don't remember as well as that. Maybe, that, maybe that's it. My <laughs> mental process No. <laughs> we already checked yours. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, the um, iron is necessary to make red blood cells. But if you have too much iron. Geritol. Geritol. That's it. Geritol. So, so yeah. I, that's for iron poor blood. Geritol had iron in it. <laughs> Even as we were talking. <laughs> 
I don't remember that long ago. I'm not I'm quite that yeah, uh, as old as you two. So, <clears throat> so, okay. So we're going to talk about hemochromatosis. Sorry, yes. Another problem that is genetic that runs in families that can cause heart disease because it increases it increases red cell count, but it also does other things. It also puts the um, iron into your brain, into your eyes, into your liver. It can cause liver damage. It can cause it actually can it can be stored in lots of different areas in your body and damage all the organs that it's stored in. So hemochromatosis causes fatigue. Mm -hmm. It also causes. I mean, there's. I had a patient that had had this. It caused weakness. She took. Her, she had testosterone, and we kept following her, but she still didn't get better. So we couldn't figure this out. And she, because she was a woman, and this was long enough ago that we hadn't weren't testing for ferritin. Mm -hmm. I then tested her ferritin because her red count kept going up. So I checked her ferritin. Well, ferritin, you know, should be at the very most in women, two hundred fifty. It was in the thousands. So when I got that result back, then I knew why the testosterone didn't make her feel better. This was masking the good of the testosterone. Right. Plus, the testosterone was making her counts go up. It was making her absorb more iron. And make her more tired. And making her more tired instead yes. of less tired. Yes. So because of her genetic problem, we, I, I sent her to the hematologist oncologist who then all she had to do was remove blood. This is very common in um, different genetic groups. So one of them is the English, Irish, Scottish, you know, the Brit British uh, islands mm -hmm. and France and some of Germany. Because it just genetically, where everybody came from, they have this genetic mutation. It, it's the disease of kings. It's why the kings always got bled for everything. So they had too much iron in their blood. And, and it also can cause you to go crazy. So that was one of the sources of crazy kings. And, you know, my, my history is not that good. You've taught it. But, you know. <laughs> there are a lot of crazy kings. Yeah. kings but because of the inbreeding. Right. There was a lot so of inbreeding, and this made genetic, this worse. The narrowing for those genetic mutations. But this Hemophilia is, is another one. Right, of those and that was an, that was another one of one of the problems. Oh, also, night sweats. Everybody thinks night sweats have to do with just loss of estrogen or loss of testosterone. Night sweats <laughs> can be too much iron. They can be a lot of things. They can be an infection. They can be you know they can be TB. They can be many things. It's not always just hormones. One of the ways, the easiest ways to figure that out is to give the hormones back, get a normal level, and see if the night sweats go away. Well, my patient's night sweats did not go away. Mm -hmm. But her FSH and LH, the two hormones that I look at to make sure I've given enough estrogen and testosterone, they came down to normal. She still had night sweats. So too I had iron. too Fair. much iron. Okay. But but that all resolved as she had her blood drawn off. But and you, she go, felt but you really go through good. a descending order of concerns. I mean, most typically yeah. it's A, then it's B, then it's C. And this is further down the line. Yes. So, but, but when I first look at blood work that comes to me, mm -hmm. I um, look to see if they're first, if they have testosterone loss, if there is a low testosterone level. But it's not just that. It's testosterone. And I look to see if the estrone in women is elevated because they usually go together. And unless they're on DIM, which is a supplement, then usually their estrone's up and their testos free testosterone is low. So those two things together give me a clue mm -hmm. that somebody that a woman needs testosterone okay. for men a really low testosterone level both total and free and a low dihydrotestosterone so you have to know a lot of things to figure out if that low testosterone is real and sometimes a high fsh and lh meaning in a man that's andropause they're never getting their testosterone to come back because their testicles have stopped making it so if those are there too that cinches the deal on testosterone then I do the other tests. Then I do the health tests. It, does this patient have diabetes? Do they have one of? Uh, do they have high blood counts? Do they have a low white count? Do do they have B twelve deficiency? Because that can make you tired. So I'm looking for all the diseases that could cause the symptoms that they have, which I'll treat as well mm -hmm. as their testosterone. If I have if I have the the knowledge to treat it or the right. training to treat it. Treat or refer. I will treat or I will refer. Right. But that happens on the before the patient even walks in my office. Right. This is like a free consult. <laughs> I look at everybody's blood tests and then if they don't need testosterone, then 
I send them to the doctor they need. So that's why you have on your website all of the the forms that people need to fill out, including mm-hmm. the request for the blood tests right. that identify the 12 tests that you want drawn mm-hmm. so that they can get that before they ever come, before mm-hmm. they ever pay a dime for anything. Right. And then see if they are candidates for this, but also to see if something else pops out that, that another and set I'm of not eyes just, is looking I'm not at. just going to go, oh, yeah, here's your lab. Yeah, I'm, you don't need to see me, but here's your lab. That's yeah. just a cop out of doctors who don't want to look it up. I mean, you can actually look it up. <laughs> you could actually see why the lab's abnormal. But like mm-hmm. people come to me, both men and women, with a high prolactin level. Well, high prolactin. We're not talking here about about blood counts, but high prolactin usually indicates either that they're smoking marijuana, which is if they tell me, then I know that that's away. all right. it is. Right. But uh, but I I need to know that. Or they're taking a lot of psychiatric drugs, which I'll know because it's on their sheet. Which sometimes do the same thing the marijuana does. Right. It's mood altering, mood right. stable. Mood and yeah. it, and so that can make the prolactin go up. They could, if it's a female, they could have just been been done nursing and they're mm-hmm. done having children. They've had their tubes tied. They want to have me check their hormones, but their prolactin may still be up. But prolactin that's up with none of those reasons, and it's up above 30, and usually in the range of 60 or above, could be a tumor in the pituitary. So those people, we send, we write them a letter and send them directly to the right doctor, which is a specialized neurosurgeon at WashU, Mm -hmm. who only does pituitaries and evaluates them and decides whether they need to be treated with medicine or they need to be treated with surgery. Wow. we have all of the avenues of of sending people to the right, right place. And that's why when I look at, at the history that's sent and I look at all of the um, lab tests, I put that together. I'm not looking at the patient, mm-hmm. but I have an idea of whether I can help them or not. And sometimes I can help them later. I say, you need to get this fixed and then we'll redraw blood. And then 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 you can come back if you need the testosterone. We'll we'll tell you that when we get your uh, repeat blood blood test. Mm-hmm. But we don't just go up oh, see ya unless somebody just sent their lab in for fun and and they really had no symptoms and they really didn't have a low testosterone. Well, you know, the the more I am exposed to what you do at your office and the work that you do, the more I learn. And and in the recent weeks, we have done a couple of podcasts on the distinctions that can be drawn between guideline-based medicine and personalized medicine, Mm -hmm. where a physician takes the time to see you as an individual, to look at your lab results, to talk to you about everything that's going on in your life, Mm -hmm. your your lifestyle choices. Are you Mm -hmm. doing marijuana? Are you exercising? Are you overeating? Uh, Did you just lose a parent? Are you suffering from grief reaction? What all is going on as a way to evaluate what your condition is and what, if anything, needs to be done in response to your condition? Right. And that takes time. I mean, you spend mm-hmm. 45 minutes to an hour in a first mm-hmm. assessment with a, with a new patient. Most physicians don't have that kind of time or don't take their time that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so it's, it's really, I would encourage you, find a physician that will talk to you. Not look at the computer that will look at you. We've done a podcast <laughs> on that as well. Mm-hmm. As the technology becomes more pervasive and intrusive, the individual sometimes recedes into the background. And in many cases, it makes no difference. I mean, a lot of things that people deal with are just so standardized. You've got the flu. You have a viral (laughs) infection. It's one synapse. One synapse in your brain with two nerves on either side that go, oh, you've got the flu. We're going to do doing this or we're not doing this. Right, right, right. But for these rare cases, I mean, and how... That's what you How need a doctor for, must not a computer. You feel <laughs> to have people on a pretty regular basis mm-hmm. come in and say, "You have changed my life, mm-hmm. or you have saved." My I love life. that. It makes my. Well, I mean, it makes who my. Who wouldn't? It, it makes it's my awesome. life amazing, and it's amazing to have the gift of being able to treat people for this yes. and be able to discern what isn't hormonal problems, what is something else, if I can treat it, if I can't, I'm sending them to the right people. So all of those things are, are just gifts for me and that I'm supposed to pass on. Well, and that's, that and is to not me, to say that your focus in medicine is to be a medical ombudsman or a gatekeeper for I'm everybody's not. issues. You have your own specialty, your own practice that you're passionate about. But the way that you run that practice is to say, I pay attention to people and I practice the art and the science of medicine. 
Yep. And, and, and that's, so, and that's how my nurse practitioners and nurses do as well. So that's all, that's all our goals. We always, and we also do what hospitals do. We sit down and talk about the most difficult, right. um, cons- cases that we take apart a patient's history together you all and learn their together. labs. Right. And, and we share knowledge and we, I go over all of that. And then oftentimes one of the nurses will go, oh, I just thought of something. It's rare, but let's look at that. So, yeah. you know, that we'll send, we'll, Tell one of our patients we need to have them come come in after we get their lab drawn and see if that's one of the things that could be interfering yeah. with what we what we're trying to do here, which is make everybody healthy so they don't need medicine. Have you ever I mean, the calculated ideas, the, the number of hands on years of experience that you and your nurses represent? Oh, adding it together? Yeah. Um 20, 30, 25. You add for me. 20, 30, 20, 30 25. 25, and 30. So you're talking about 130 years of experience mm-hmm. in, in, in in one place. In one place. But this this is the the I guess I want you to leave knowing about things that can go wrong, specifically too many red blood cells, a high red blood cell count, and how easy it is to treat. Yeah. If you get your diagnosis and how important that is to your life. But I also want you to, to think about when you go to somebody who's going, goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I can do pellets. I can stick some pellets in. I mean, okay, the procedure itself is not rocket science. That's not the deal. It's the, the science and keeping up on the research and knowing what is not testosterone-based, what could be another illness, where you go when you get it, and, and all of the troubleshooting that we do, we've developed over the last 12 to 13 years. So remember, red blood cell counts matter too, and make sure that you get them checked out. It's, it, it could be a lifesaver. In this case, it was a lifesaver. Yeah, it was. And as always, thank you so much for listening to our podcast. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.